Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to present today's Summit to Fight Fraud. I also wanted to take this time to welcome all of those joining us via live stream, and just to remind the audience that today's event is being live streamed and recorded. Also, if you could, please silence your phones. The Pension Action Center, also known as PAC, is proud to present today's program. We are particularly proud to be celebrating this event in 2024, as this is also the year that we mark our 30th anniversary of our program. Uh, we have spent the past 30 years dedicated to helping secure retirement benefits for retirees, workers, and their families. Our team has fought to ensure that the benefits promised to workers after years of labor are upheld, and to make sure that every retiree receives exactly what was promised to them. It is because of this work that we have found ourselves eager to take on the fight against fraud and scams that target older adults and their families. No retiree should worry about their pension or 401k being stolen due to a scam or have to worry about the loss of their fixed income during what should be some of the best years of their lives. Today's program is made possible through the sponsorship of Investor Protection Trust and is co-presented with the Massachusetts Securities Division. We are excited to learn more about how older adults and those that serve the aging population can learn to avoid, prevent, and face the rise of fraud targeting our communities. We will hear experts explain the ways in which older adults and their families can protect themselves from fraud and scams, particularly with the ever-increasing use of technology for day-to-day -day life. We will begin today's program with a few remarks from the director of the Gerontology Institute, the dean of the Manning College of Nursing and Health Sciences, a representative from the Massachusetts Securities Division, and the Secretary of the Commonwealth, William Galvin. Afterwards, we will have Anna Tabor, who will moderate our morning panel, reports from the field with leading experts in the community to discuss the current and on the rise scams. After the morning panel, we will break for lunch, followed by a keynote address from Michael E. Festa from AARP. The afternoon panels will include updates from Massachusetts Securities Division and the Attorney General's Office, followed by our final panel, advice from the experts in the field of banking and fraud regulation. Presenters will take questions from the audience at the end of each panel, and there will be a microphone circulating, so please do not hesitate to ask any questions. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jan Mutschler, Director of the Gerontology Institute and Professor of Gerontology here at University of Massachusetts, Boston. Her research focuses on financial security in later life, including the impact of rising cost of living index, or sorry, the rising cost of living expenses on retirement and security. Jan and her team produced the Elder Law Index, an online tool dedicated to measuring the income needed for older adults to meet their basic needs in retirement. Jan is a great supporter of not only PAC's work, but all the amazing work done at Gerontology Institute. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jan. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, on behalf of all of our colleagues at the Gerontology Department and Institute, I want to welcome you to campus. Um, this is such an important event, such a timely topic, and I appreciate your being here. I think everybody in this room knows that scams and fraud that target older adults um, those are huge problems, and there's problems that we really struggle to deal with. Um, if you're like me, you see warnings about these things everywhere, um, but we know that there are uh, populations that don't see those warnings, um, and I think many of us, um, even of those of us who are aware of the problem, perhaps don't know what to do to avoid being caught in those, those difficulties, and um, we don't know what to do if something does happen. Who do we contact? How do we, how do we resolve the question? Um, so I hope that today's com conversation is really just going to be the beginning of more discussion discussions about this important issue, how we can work together to address these challenges. Um, I'm very grateful to the team at the Pension Action Center for all the efforts they make to elevate this issue, and I'm grateful to all of you for being here to be part of the d discussion. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our dean. Um, Dr. Bo Fernhall is dean of the Donna M. and Robert J. Manning College of Nursing and Health Sciences. He's an expert in exercise physiology and cardiac rehab. He's a prolific researcher, and he's received many awards and citations for his work. Um, all of us in gerontology are so grateful for his leadership and for his support of what we do in gerontology, and we're honored that he's here with us today. So, both. Thank you, Jan. 
Welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to see so many people. And the fact that the Pension Action Center is putting, in, putting on such an important meeting as this. The Pension Action Center epitomizes what we in our college really believe in and do every day. Every one of our departments, every one of our faculty and students, what we strive to do is improve people's lives one person at a time. And I think this is what the Pension Action Center really does. Obviously, this is a really important topic. And it is having some personal meaning for me as I am getting closer to wanting retirement security. Uh, and I just think that this is so timely. We see these messages all the time. Beware, beware, beware. And of course, this meeting, you're going to find all the solutions, right? <laughs> but at least the start towards making it better. So thank you all for coming. It's really appreciated. And I hope that everybody has a really productive day. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Anthony Leone, Deputy Secretary for the Massachusetts Securities Division. Thank you, everybody, for attending this wonderful program today. I am pleased to introduce Secretary of the Commonwealth, William Francis Galvin. Secretary Galvin serves as the Chief Securities Regulator in the Commonwealth, in addition to being in charge of overseeing elections, corporations, archives, among other items. The Secretary has been a champion of investor protection for many years. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce Secretary of the Commonwealth, William Francis Galvin. Thank you, Anthony. It's, it is great to be with you this morning, and as the Dean mentioned, this is a very timely and important topic. Um, we've been at this effort in the Securities Division now under my leadership for almost 30 years, and while the, the fundamentals remain the same, namely deceit and misleading information and concealment, uh, the technology has changed, and unfortunately, as a result of the changed technology, the risk is greater. The fact of the matter is older people are often more isolated, yet at the same time have technology. In fact, their only contact with outside the outside world is often through their technology, whether it's their phone, their computer, or something else. And the sophistication of scammers is almost changing every year to become worse. And the location of scammers, traditionally we would be able to arrest somebody if we found them or caught them. You can't catch them because they're not here, they're elsewhere. And the sophistication of technology has also been enhanced, unfortunately, by some of the technological companies that are providing access on a targeted basis to individuals. What does this all mean? What it means is, is the risk to individual citizens is much greater. The traditional thing of, oh, we have a secret investment, uh, you invest in this, you're going to make a lot of money, or don't tell anybody, those things have gone by the board. Today, we're dealing with grandparent scams. We're dealing with you know, your, some urgent crisis, you have to give us cash right away. One of the things that we've seen most prevalent and most troubling is the effort by scammers to prey on people, not only to give them money, but to give it to them immediately to go down to the bank and take the money out and give it to somebody who's sitting in a car waiting outside. This is such a problem, not just here in Massachusetts, but throughout the country. We've seen national legislation enacted that, uh, throughout the country that we're trying to enact here that will give financial institutions the ability to pause transactions when they suspect something is wrong. And if you think this is an isolated situation, it's not. We held a hearing on the legislation which I initiated just last October. The bill is now currently pending before the legislature. But just a couple of weeks ago, a similar incident played out in Bill Rickett to the one we told the committee about in October, which is an individual was told there was an emergency, they had to give money for their grandchild, they were taken to the bank, they ended up giving them $9,000 and gone forever. 
This goes on day in, day out, year in, year out. We have many means by which we're going to try to track this, but clearly the most effective and immediate means would be to make sure the banks and other financial institutions do not process these transactions when they have some reason for suspicion. At the same time, it's a balancing act. We want to make sure that individuals get access to their money. No one's going to deprive them of that. But it's pretty obvious if somebody's been a regular bank customer and they're very elderly, and they suddenly show up wanting to withdraw large sums of money in cash, that something's up. And in the past, we've been limited to calling the local police department, trying to find a relative. That's seldom enough. We need something better. And the legislation now pending is something better. And we want to get it enacted before this legislative session ends in July. When I spoke to the Financial Services Committee last October, I said, if I could predict to you confidently that somebody was going to rob a bank unless you change the law, you'd change the law. Here we have a situation where I can confidently predict to you somebody's going to rob somebody here in Massachusetts unless we do something, we need to do something now. Now, that doesn't mean all the rest of us can then rest and say we're all set. Scams are beyond these types of scams that are most, are most grievous. Uh, we know there are simpler ones and more uh, complicated ones in a sense because they're simpler in the, in the sense they're easily accessed, but at the same time it's complicated because it has some new twist. And clearly the rise of Bitcoin and the legitimization of Bitcoin investments by major financial institutions presents another risk. Whenever you're dealing with something that seems like it's new and they're missing out on something, there's a risk. So these are all the facets of scams that we're experiencing. And this is costing our citizens here in Massachusetts a lot of money. So your help in getting the word out, planning strategies, and effectively working on this is critically important. I'm pleased that my office has been able to offer this support uh, in addition to the, the regulatory actions that we engage in. And I hope that as a result of this conference and other efforts like this, we can improve the situation for our citizens here in Massachusetts. Thank you for your good work. So t right now, we'll have our first moderation panel of the day, reports from the field. Anna Marie Tabor from the UMass Law School will be moderating the panel with Layla R. D'Amelia, Undersecretary of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation, Rachel A. Weber, Elders and Persons with Disabilities Abuse Unit Coordinator from the NWB, Emily K. Shea, Commissioner at Age Strong Commission, City of Boston, Vikram Jagadish, attorney at the Federal Trade Commission, and Matthew J. Libby, chief of enforcement at the Massachusetts Securities Division. Thank you, Tyler. And um, I want to welcome you to our first panel of the, of the day today, Reports from the Field. I'm honored to be here with such a distinguished um, panel of guests from federal and state agencies, people who are truly on the front lines of the fight against fraud. And today they're going to share their observations of what they and their colleagues have been seeing. And they're also going to offer their advice, both advice for practitioners who perhaps are hoping to start an anti-fraud program or um, build a program that they already have, but also advice for all of us as individuals who are living in a world that unfortunately is rife with fraud and scams. Um, so um, let's start by introducing our panelists. Um, first, Leila Demelia is the Undersecretary of the Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation, which is part of the Massachusetts Executive Office of Economic Development. As Undersecretary, she oversees five agencies while leveraging her unique background in law, regulatory affairs, policy, and public safety to protect and empower consumers and support the Secretariat's goal of widespread economic development across the Commonwealth. Prior to her appointment as Undersecretary, she served as Commissioner for the Division of Occupational Licensure, which licenses and regulates more than 500,000 individuals, businesses, and schools in Massachusetts. Thank you, Undersecretary D'Amelio, for joining us today. Next, I'd like to introduce Vikram Jagadish, who is a trial attorney at the Federal Trade Commission, working in the Northeast Regional Office. He investigates and litigates a wide variety of fraud cases involving vulnerable victims, including the elderly. 
At the FTC, he serves on a pandemic fraud task force and routinely gives presentations to the public on avoiding fraud relating to investments and emerging technologies. Before joining the FTC, he worked for several years at the Justice Department as a trial lawyer, focusing on complex international criminal investigations. Thank you, Vikram, for joining us today. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Matthew Libby, who is the Chief of the Enforcement Section of the Securities Division of the Office of the Secretary of the Commonwealth. In this role, Matt supervises regulatory investigations and actions concerning broker-dealers, investment advisors, and registered and unregistered individuals. He's represented the Securities Division as lead counsel in a number of high-profile matters, including matters related to digital engagement practices, supervision of regulated persons, private securities transactions, and commission practices. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for joining us. I'm also pleased to welcome Emily Shea, who has been serving as the Age Strong Commissioner for the City of Boston since April 2011. Age Strong serves as the Boston's Area Agency on Aging and Boston's Council on Aging. In her role as commissioner, she launched Age Friendly Boston, a collaborative initiative focused on making Boston an even better place to live and to age. Over the past 30 years, Commissioner Shea has been committed to the field of aging and improving the quality of life for older adults by increasing social connection, economic security, and access to health and wellness. Thank you, Commissioner Shea, for joining us today. And next, I'd like to welcome Rachel Weber, who is the coordinator of the Elders and Persons with Disabilities Abuse Unit at the Northwestern District Attorney's Office. She coordinates multidisciplinary investigations into reports of abuse of vulnerable adults. She also conducts community outreach presentations at local senior centers and residential facilities on different forms of financial exploitation. Rachel is the triad representative for the Northwestern DA's office. And as you'll be hearing today, triad is a community police policing initiative that brings several public safety departments together to increase the safety of older adults living in the community. Welcome, Rachel, and thank you for joining us. All right, so to get started, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to weigh in on um, this question of, you know, so what are, what are you seeing? Um, you know, we all, we all um, have experienced fraud and scams, I imagine every one of us um, individually, um, but we'd love to hear what, what you and your colleagues are seeing through your work. Uh, Vikram, would you like to start us out? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Anna Marie, and thank you, uh, UMass Boston, the Pension Action Center for Having us, this is a really important uh, venue for us to do the meat of our work, which is educating all of you on uh, scams and how to prevent them and how to take that back to folks who really need it the most, so thank you. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing, uh, it is certainly a banner year for fraudsters. Uh, we, last year in 2023, consumers lost something about $10 billion uh, per our figures uh, to fraud. Uh, at least, and that, that's what we know about based on those who've chosen to report to us. So the true number may be much, how, much higher than that. Uh, in terms of the number of reports that we've seen, it was also a banner year for us. We uh, had maybe our second highest ever reports of fraud. Last year, 5.4 million reports of fraud, and uh, which is, you know, I wish, it's not something that you know, we should take lightly. It certainly is a warning sign for all of us in this profession. Uh, the types of scams are getting more brazen, more bold, and really something that should scare all of us. Uh, in terms of the top three that we're seeing, uh, by far the most common that we've seen is imposter scams. And what are those? Uh, imposter scams uh, may be someone claiming to impersonate a business or a government agency, uh, and they can be very convincing. Uh, they can spoof a domain name uh, and make it look like someone's receiving an email from a bank or from the government, or they've even spoofed successfully government office numbers. Our own FTC Northeast Regional Office was one of them. Uh, recently, we have received reports that our own numbers were scammed, uh, or spoofed, rather. Uh, so they'll impersonate a government agency or business and ask consumers to fork over large amounts of money in a very convincing fashion. Uh, the second most uh, common type of fraud we're seeing is identity theft. It uh, runs the gamut from traditional identity theft, uh, something as simple as a vendor having a data breach, and then you know, someone's social security number, their bank account numbers are all out there for anybody to grab, to 
something a lot more sinister and long term in terms of identity theft. I mean, like we'll see this happen in terms of like romance scams. People will be very convinced to hand over personal details and then all of a sudden that person finds out that they have 50 different bank accounts or they bought a property or what have you. So identity theft remains a persistent danger out there. Um, and the third we're seeing uh, in light of the explosion in e-commerce, especially uh, post-pandemic, are online shopping and uh, gift card scams. So this could be as simple as someone ordering a product that they never got to something along the lines of getting enrolled unwittingly into some long-term subscription service that they never wanted or asked for and could never return the goods for, and then they're out before they know it to the tune of several thousand dollars. So we're seeing, those are our top three that we're seeing in our kind of area of operations, but by far the one that really is concerning us are these kind of imposter scams because you're becoming more common, more brazen, and if you look at the reports that we get, it's just, the most common that we see. Thank you, Vikram, for that view from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, Under Secretary D'Amelia, how, how about you? What is your agency seeing? Thank you for having me here today. So we run by statute the consumer hotline in Massachusetts. So we have a, a group of folks who answered the hotline. And we um, work with the Attorney General's office very closely on a lot of the stuff that we work on. Um, you know. Uh, my colleague here talking about identity theft. So by law, you ha when, when there is a data breach, the employer has to file that with our office and with the Attorney General's office. I can tell you in 2023, so it's done by calendar year, there were 2,427 data breaches reported. So reported is the key. They have to report to us. That accounted for 6.6 .6 million people in the Commonwealth affected. That that, that could be one person actually with a, multiple data breaches depending on, um, so it's not so cumulative, it's, it could be more than, the, the person could have been affected once or twice or three times. Um, so we are seeing uh, exactly what my colleague here said, government imposter scams that the IRS is calling that you owe them money, um, that you're gonna, uh, your Medicare benefits are, are gonna be dropped, um, we're seeing identity theft and uh, gift card scams um, as well. And um, I think one of the things that I will say that this is the perspective I'm from my seat here is when I you know, first began a year ago, the, the senior citizens were sort of most affected by these scams. A year later, the Better Business Bureau just put out that the cohort of people that are actually being scammed at the, the most right now is the 18 to 24 year olds. That is, I have a daughter in college and I talk to her about, you know, slow down, don't click links. Um, it's not always accurate. If it says spam risk, if someone's calling you, don't answer it. Um, and I think I, I say this to you because I think by doing this education that folks are actually slowing down listening and understanding um, sort of the, the, the perpetrators that are always sort of one step ahead of us. We're catching up to them and folks are really pulling back and not being scammed and defrauded, which is really a testament to the folks on this panel, but also to the folks here in this room that also talk to their family members and their friends to, to tell them to kind of stop, think, don't click that link um, and I think the other backdrop here um, that we hear a lot about are home improvement contractor scams. So our office actually runs the home improvement contractor program. And I think, you know, I would say just personally, post, during the pandemic, um, a lot of folks wanted, decided to get home improvement renovations. So there was an uptick of home improvement renovations. Um, in this state, you must be a registered HIC contractor, and there are, there are protections that come with that registration for the consumer. And so we are seeing a lot of that type of fraud where uh, a, home, a contractor will show up, they, they are not registered, but they'll use a friend's registration. They won't give you a contract, which is, you know, by, you're, you're supposed to get a contract. They won't pull permits, or they'll tell you it'll be cheaper if we don't pull a permit. Again, that would uh, that in of itself is fraud. And if they're not registered, there are certain protections consumers 
actually can't avail themselves to, so we're really trying to get the education out there. There's about 31,000 registered home improvement contractors, and you can find them on our website listed if they're registered, so that, that is sort of one of the, the top things that we hear about. Great. Thank you, Under Secretary. Matt, what are you seeing in the Securities Division? Yeah, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, you, with the uh, Securities Division, <clears throat> you know, we regulate uh, broker-dealers and investment advisors as well as uh, certain uh, registered or unregistered uh, investments. Um, so typically what we're seeing is stuff in, in you know, the investment space when people are trying to invest their money and, and seek a return. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of scams out there that uh, impact not just seniors but people of all ages. Um, I think the most common scheme that we see, uh, we see probably on a weekly if not more frequent basis, um, is what's called a pig butchering scheme. Uh, the most common fact pattern for this type of activity is someone will receive a text message or a WhatsApp message um, from someone purporting to look for somebody else. So it's a wrong number. Um, and when the, the victim responds and says, hey, you get the wrong number, well, a conversation strikes up. Inevitably, the person says, oh, hey, by the way, uh, I've made a whole bunch of money investing on this platform for cryptocurrency or whatever, and maybe you should take a look at it too. There's a website that seems very convincing. So the victim will go on and, and create an account um, and, and perhaps put a little bit of money in there and see how it does. But in reality, this is just a video game. There, there's no actual investment. Once the money's been transferred over, the money's gone. But this person, the victim, sees on, on, on this dashboard, well, I'm doing really well. So they write another check or they transfer more money over and they see them, it's going up and up and up. And then eventually this, the victim might say, hey, you know what, I'd like to cash out <clears throat> and enjoy some of my, my profits here. And at that point, uh, the, the scammer will say, well, hold on, you got to prepay taxes or there's a fee associated or there's always something, right? Um, and, and so perhaps the person pays that, that, even, that extra amount of money. Um, but ultimately, at a certain point, the victim will say, enough's enough, I want my money. Well, at that point, the scammer's gone and the money's gone. Um, and, and that's, by and large, the most common thing that we see. Um, as Secretary Galvin noted, um, you know, it's the same type of deceit that's always existed. It just uses new technology. And unfortunately here, because of the new technology, these people aren't local. This is international. So the best way to prevent this is to, 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 to educate people and make them understand that these are not legitimate investments. Um, and if, if people who fall prey to these things, the odds of them getting their money back are very low. Um, so you want to avoid these things and you want to talk to uh, your family members, your friends, people in your community about this. They're, again, they're very similar fact patterns that happen. Um, but the more people can be aware of this stuff, uh, the better. Uh, we also see a lot of <clears throat> uh, unregistered investment activity in the form of promissory notes. Um, oftentimes this is in connection with perhaps a, a real estate developer who says, hey, I'm going to develop these houses. I'm going, to, I'm going to sell them and make a profit, but I just need some money to get that off the ground. So why don't you buy this promissory note? I'm going to guarantee you 12% a year on these things, right? Well, 12% is much higher than you're going to get at a bank. Um, and, and oftentimes, these promissory notes, it's guaranteed. You know, they say, hey, come and look at the, the house itself. It's here, right? But what you don't know is that this contractor is heavily in debt, that the properties that they're working on are, are mortgaged to the hilt, <clears throat> okay? And ultimately what these, these promissory note scams are, are Ponzi schemes. Um, the, the person is bringing in just enough new investment to allow them to make the interest payments on these things. Um, and, and sometimes it, it'll go on for a number of years. They're able to bring in enough new investments to, to make these uh, periodic interest payments out, but eventually it collapses like a house of cards and victims uh, are lost, have lost their principal investment. Um, with respect to stuff like that, highly recommend you call our office. <clears throat> um, investments such as these need to be registered uh, either at the federal or state level, uh, or they need to fall in some sort of exemption. Um, so before you, you know, write the check, make a phone call, do your due diligence, look into it. Because again, it's a lot easier to, at the front end, uh, 
realize that something's not legit and pass on it than it is to try to deal with it once the money's been sent over. Um, I think a common theme you're going to hear today is uh, scammers try to create a sense of urgency. And I think to the extent that you can uh, step back and say, hold on a second, uh, let me think about this, let me talk to a trusted friend, let me call the securities division or, or you know, some other uh, agency and get some perspective, I think you can hopefully avoid uh, falling victim to these things. Because again, it, it impacts everybody. Everyone is susceptible to these things. Um, uh, as the Under Secretary said, we see this impacting young people as well as uh, older people. So it impacts everyone, and, and I think just education is the best way to avoid it. Thank you so much, Matt. Commissioner Shea, how about you? What are you seeing at H-Strong? Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, so we're seeing a number of things at H Strong, probably all of the things that folks have already said. Um, in addition, we're a SNAP outreach partner, as many of the councils on aging are. Um, and so we've seen a lot of the, um, the DTA, the SNAP um, skimming with the cards where folks are putting uh, skimmers and then when, when someone runs their SNAP card through to get groceries, um, they're getting, uh, then those skimmers allow someone to access their SNAP account and to take the money out of that account so that uh, they then have no money on the card. So we're working, we work closely with DTA and uh, with our, the older adults in Boston uh, to try to um, stop that from happening. Also to try to make sure that people understand how to change their um, password on a regular basis to prevent that skimming from happening. Um, we also, uh, the city of Boston uh, has, did a municipal aggregation for, um, for energy. Um, and so instead of going through, uh, you still, it's, it's still partnering with Eversource, but essentially uh, you can purchase your energy through the city of Boston's kind of municipal aggregation program. Um, so when we started that, there were a lot of people going door to door in Boston, saying that they were from the city of Boston and trying to sell people these energy programs um, and getting their personal information or switching them to a program that the person didn't want to sign up for. Um, and so those are some of the things that we try and get the word out about. Um, we also, in my office, see a lot of Social Security and Medicare scams, so people calling folks on the phone saying they're from Social Security or Medicare and oh could you just um, give me your account number you know I maybe you've uh, they'll say something to the effect you know someone's trying to get into your account I just need to confirm your account number um, and and that way they'll be accessing their information so those are those are some of the things that we're seeing out there thank you Commissioner Rachel how about you what is your office seeing Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I, I will echo what uh, Secretary Galvin stated about the, the grandparent scams. It's an oldie but a goodie. Um, I feel like that's a scam that we hear, we've heard about for years now, but it is still very much uh, prominent in the elder abuse realm. Um, folks are getting phone calls in the middle of the night. They're scared. And everyone that I've ever spoken to who has lost money to a grandparent scam has said two things. One, they asked questions, but they had an answer for everything. These scammers have heard the questions that they're being asked and they're prepared with answers. And also, you know, they, they also say, part of me knew down in my heart of hearts that this may be a scam, but the stakes were so high that should this actually be true, I had to act. I, I, I felt like I was in a trance, is usually what they say. So I, and that is, uh, even in the past month, there was one week in, in February where I, I received three reports of three different individuals from the same town who lost several thousand dollars to these, these grandparent scams. So those are, they're still, they're, they're working. They're working and these scammers are getting a lot of money <coughs> from them. Uh, the, the second type of scam that I'm seeing a lot is romance scams. Uh, I see a lot of, of head nodding. Um, so this is a scam that originates usually through social media or a dating app. 
or website, folks meet someone, they strike up a conversation, this conversation eventually turns into what the person believes is a loving relationship, um, and eventually the person on the other end will start asking for money, and there will always be a reason why they cannot meet in person, or talk on the phone, or FaceTime, or there's always some sort of reason. And these scams, I, in my opinion, are the worst of the worst, because you're in, this is someone's emotional well-being that you're dealing with. And there's a great deal of grooming involved in a romance scam. And, and grooming is a term that you typically hear in child abuse cases, when an, an offender will, will groom their victim. This is what's happening in these romance scams. These scammers are preparing their victims for resistance from fam friends and family members. So if you, a person who is working with this person, says, you know, I, I don't think this person is real, they're prepared to say, oh, I knew, you know, this person told me that you wouldn't believe me, you, you, you don't want me to be happy, and this, this distance begins to form between you and the older adult. And that's exactly what these offenders want. They want to isolate these people so far away from their friends and family that they become all that they have. So that's a really, a very frustrating um, scam to deal with as a professional and as someone who personally knows someone who's wrapped up in this. Um, and we are also seeing kind of a, a, an interesting trend in the way that these scams are being, um, being done. So I, like, I call them sort of a shifting scam. So it will, it will begin under the pretext of, you know, oh, you didn't, we see you didn't pay your electric bill. You're going to need to pay now or else we're going to turn off your electricity. Or there's a computer virus on your, your software. We need to, to, you need to pay us $500 to help you. So the person will go along with this scammer, and when the scammer realizes the person is picking up what they're putting down, the scam will shift, and they will say, you know, oh, oh my goodness, I, I just got in contact with your bank, and it turns out your bank account is in jeopardy for some reason. And, but it's okay, we have a solution. We'll move all of your money, every last cent you have in your account, into this new account, which is secure. So what, what started as a scam that may have put someone out a couple of hundred dollars has now turned into a scam that has taken every last cent out of their bank accounts. So they are still, you know, as much as professionals in this realm talk about scams and fraud, they are still working. So we have to keep the conversation going. As, you know, as much as we may feel like a broken record, you know, if a hundred people know and one person doesn't, and that one person gets that phone call, the scammers are gonna get 50 grand. So we have to just keep these conversations going. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me ask about uh, artificial intelligence driven scams, these, these deep fakes, which we're hearing about a lot in the news. Um, so, you know, a situation where scammers will create a fake video um, or maybe even get a snippet of someone's voice off of the internet and use that to uh, replicate that person's voice so that a phone call sounds like it's coming from a loved one. Um, when it in fact is coming from a scammer. Um, we're hearing a lot about this um, uh, in the media, but is this something that you are seeing on the ground yet? I, I will say from the Office of Consumer Affairs, uh, we have not, it's not been really reported to us. I do know that, that, that it's happening um, and we're seeing it, but not at the extent I think that, um, which is I think good because people are talking about it. I think people are aware that there could be some AI uh, uh, focus now as well. So I don't know if any of my colleagues on the panel are different. I oh. would oops, oh, go, go ahead. Good. I would agree. I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of direct reports of that actually happening to people, but almost every you know outreach event I go to, someone comes up and says, "Have you heard about AI yet?" So so people do know. They they're kind of expecting that these scams are going to really ramp up. I will say that from the FTC's point of view, um, we are seeing actually some reports of that going on. Uh, maybe not as much as some of the more traditional imposter scams that we're seeing, but we are seeing more and more reports coming into us about AI-driven scams. Uh, and it's certainly getting a lot of attention, which is a good thing, because I think the more people know about this kind of scam, the more they can be ready, willing, and able to exercise some judgment, you know, pause, maybe check with the loved one or relative, hey, are you actually in trouble, like what's going on? 
you know, and possibly in a position to stop it. You know, we, it's something we're very concerned about and we're monitoring, and we certainly have at least a few reports coming in about it, so um, it's something that we are trying to figure out how best to stop. Okay. Yeah, same. We don't really see it right now, but I would be surprised if it's not happening as we speak here. Um, we do see a lot of, you know, fake websites that are using, you know, maybe the names of actual real brokers and they take the, the, the photograph of the real broker, but they create a different website. Um, we see that all the time. And, and some of these websites are pretty sophisticated. Uh, I go on and look at them and I, number one, look at these things all the time. And number two, know that there's probably something wrong with this website. And it might take me 10 or 15 minutes to kind of figure out where the issue is. So it, it is very sophisticated and they've reached a point where um, it's very difficult to tell the difference between something that's uh, a scam and, and is not. And that's where I would say you need to kind of move beyond just what's on the screen in front of you and use other resources. Your friends, you know, uh, your family members that you trust, uh, contacting you know, my office or, or another uh, office that may be able to provide some assistance and say, hey, hold on a second, you know, is this really the, uh, you know, what they say that it is? Because um, it, it, it is very difficult now. The, the, the technology is at a level where um, you, it's not, you know, the, the uh, kind of almost humorous uh, slap shot efforts that you'd see before. Now it's, it's very sleek. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's now talk about that that moment, right, where you've, you've been so careful, you, 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 there are so many links that you haven't clicked on, but, but you get that sinking feeling that, you know what, this time you did click on the link that was a bad link, or you did give out your personal information to someone who you thought was trustworthy, but, but you're realizing after the fact that it's not. So um, I'd like to ask the panelists, what should someone do in that moment when, when, because it happens, unfortunately, to everyone? What should you do in that moment where you realize that you have engaged in a scam? Vikram, let's start with you. Sure. So I think the first thing to, that happens is if you realize you've been the victim of a scam, it's to first take a breath and understand that it happens to everyone. You know, don't be ashamed. It may feel humiliating, it may feel awful, it may feel frustrating, it may feel every one of those terrible things, but it happens to everyone. It has happened to me, it has happened to senior fraud investigators I've worked with, it has happened to so, so many people that it is certainly important to understand that you're not alone. And the next thing you should do is take stock of the situation. Uh, what has happened, what do they have, um, who do I need to call? If they have your bank account information, you have to call the bank. Make sure you lock down whatever accounts that you have. Uh, if you have any inclination that they have your social security number, you have to call a social security agency. Uh, lock down everything you can based on what it is the scammer has been given. Then it's important to also report this to the appropriate authorities. Uh, reporting is such a vital step. I, if there's any one thing I encourage victims of scam to do is to report it to anybody and everybody who could possibly have a mission related to stopping fraud. Uh, where, what does that mean? So the first, one of the most important things to do is to go to the Internet Crime Complaint Center. It's an online resource where a lot of the first step reporting for scams happen. It's ic3.gov, that's the website, um, and in all my presentations consumers, I say, write that down. Uh, your local police is also an important step. Uh, a lot of times you may need to file a police report. Uh, certainly a lot of insurance companies may want you to do that. Uh, it's important that law enforcement knows right away what's going on. The FTC, certainly it's vital that you report it to the FTC and to any state and local fraud authorities that might have a responsibility, the Attorney General's office, um, if there's a securities component, securities division, it's important you report it there as well. And why is reporting important? Can we stop every last scammer out there? Unfortunately, the answer is no. I wish I could. I really wish that, that could be the case. But even if we can't stop every last scammer, the reports are vital in the enforcement work that we do. It helps us understand the global picture of what's going on. It helps us share information with people who may be able to bring a case. And it also helps us create new rules that we can use to stop scammers as well. So, Important to know you're not alone, report the scam, lock down any uh, accounts that you may have, and start the process of helping us figuring out how to stop these. Thank you. 
Um, uh, Commissioner Shea, Rachel, do you have anything that you would add to that? Sure. Um, so I would add that, you know, in my office, when we work with our older residents who come to us, um, we first, as you're saying, kind of make sure that we're coordinating directly with the whatever account it is that they're having an issue with. So reaching out to Social Security, reaching out to DTA, talking to the bank, talking to the credit card company, um, and making sure that they understand and they're in the loop on what's going on and getting direction on how they think um, things should be handled from their, from their end of things. Um, but I would say, you know, uh, Vikram, you just listed like a long list of places to, to talk to. And I would say that there's some confusion out there on the part, there's so many people that you can report scams to. You know, we always reach out to the Boston Police Department. I had never heard of the ic3.gov website. Um, but there's the Office of Consumer Affairs and Licensing, the Attorney General's Office, the DA's Office, the Federal Trade Commission, the AARP Fraud Watch Hotline. Um, and so, you know, I think from a provider perspective out there, like kind of talking from a Council on Aging and Area Agency on Aging perspective, um, it would be helpful to get some um, guidance as to kind of for these scams, report to these places. For this type of scam, report to these places. Some type of guidance because I feel like it's a little murky and hard to kind of wade through exactly where you should report. Uh, well, that's funny you say that because um, I have a resource that's actually very helpful in that realm because it is overwhelming. You know, how I just got scammed, I lost my life savings, I don't want to be calling 18 people and telling them that. So, <laughs> yes. So they gave me this little clicker here. I'm gonna try it out. Point. Oh, it worked. All right, so this is a poster, and these posters are also over there in that little uh, table over there, so please do grab one on your way out. Uh, this is the National Elder Fraud Hotline. So uh, this is run by the Department of Justice. It's a national uh, resource, and they have advocates who work with people who have specifically lost money to scams not just experienced a scam, but have lost money. Uh, they help them figure out where to report, who they've already reported to, what's more important. You know, you should obviously call your financial institution first. Um, and they have, they help you, there's someone on your side to help you get through this. And it's also helpful that, you know, people do experience a lot of shame when they are scammed. So this is a, an unbiased third party. So it's not a family member, you know, they don't have to tell people they may not want to tell. Uh, so it's very, very helpful. And um, I will also emphasize reporting to local law enforcement um, because, again, it, it really does give us a good idea of what's going on. So those of us who work in the fraud prevention fields can really hone in our efforts to make sure people are getting the right information at the, in a timely manner. Um, and sometimes, depending on the way money is sent or lost, sometimes law enforcement can help uh, get that back. So in my jurisdiction, we had an individual mail $15,000 in cash through FedEx, and uh, law enforcement was able to get that package back before it got to its destination. Um, so quickly, you know, acting fast is always very important. Um, and also local law, at least in my jurisdiction, when my police departments get a report of a scam, they call me, because I'm the person that they, they know. And so I then blast that information out to all of the Council on Aging directors in my jurisdiction so that they know what's going on. Because usually these scams will pop up in, in clusters. So if one person gets the, this call, it's likely someone else maybe down the street will get that call. So it, it just helps us get people aware of what's happening in real time. Great, thank you. Um, so I just want to reiterate, because I heard this from several of you, the importance of locking down your accounts, your, your financial accounts that are affected, um, uh, or your, um, your, your benefits accounts as well, um, uh, you know, calling the, the DTA or the Social Security Administration. Um, uh, so that's, that's helpful to hear, um, in addition to reporting to um, the IC3.gov and other, other law enforcement agencies. Um, and I also um, wanted to um, mention, again, um, the AARP 
Fraud Watch um, and their helpline. Um, we're, we're pleased to be joined today by Mike Festa from AARP, who will be speaking at lunchtime. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll be telling us more about that, but that's another resource that's available to provide help and guidance to people who have, um, who have been in, engaged with a fraud. Um, so now I'd like to turn to our law enforcement panelists. So we just, we just talked about what the individual can do. Um, now I'd like to ask you, what is law enforcement doing? Can you tell us about um, you know, what, what kind of work is taking place to, uh, to stop these uh, scams from happening in the first place and to catch the perpetrators? Sure. Um, so at least I'll offer from the FTC's perspective. Uh, so a lot of uh, programmatically what we're doing in terms of our enforcement work uh, is trying to go after, you know, nodes of activity where a lot of these scams may be taking place. So a lot of these, like imposter scams, might be calling from numbers like this, they're constantly recycled, um, constantly changed, um, and they use maybe voice over internet protocol or something like that to actually kind of constantly churn and burn these numbers to really you know, up their game at scamming people. So a lot of times we may actually reach out to some of those providers and issue warning letters and say, um, well, this is what's going, what we know is going on with your platform. Uh, we know that, you've been, that your platform is being used by telemarketing scammers to impersonate government agencies or impersonate banks. Um, here's why we know it's you, uh, and we'll include some of the information we've learned from consumer reporting. Uh, about numbers, we've traced them, and uh, or we'll figure out who the providers are and say, here's how we know that. You need to be aware of it, you need to stop it, or we'll actually take action. And so a lot of times where we see these kind of overseas-based, you know, scammers using uh, VoIP numbers to go after people and impersonation scams, we'll, you know, even if we can't directly bring a case, we'll be on the tip of the spear and actually go reach out to the providers to stop it. And a lot of times in, our, uh, in other types of scam work, well, actually, if we can bring a case, we totally will. Uh, so in terms of you know, identity theft, for example, a lot of times that takes the form of data breach litigation. So if we see uh, a lot of identity theft victims uh, trace the identity theft to a certain data breach that happened, uh, and we'll get notice of that through our investigative work, then we'll actually go after the company. I mean, a good example of that is the Drizzly case. We, uh, Drizzly was a you know, beverage company, and they had seriously deficient data protection practices, and we had a lot of complaints about identity theft um, as a result of uh, Drizzly customers having their information compromised. So we were able to put together a case, and eventually uh, we were able to reach a order that we entered against Drizzly to uh, address that behavior and you know, crack down on their shoddy data practices. Uh, so you know, we, when we have enforcement abilities, we absolutely will take them. It, like I said before, it's impossible to go after every single last one, I wish we could, but where we can have large nodes or locations where the act, this activity is taking place and we have the ability to reach out and try and put a stop to it, we absolutely will. With the securities division, um, if we get information about you know potential Ponzi scheme that's active uh, or some sort of uh, fraud such as that, uh, we typically try to uh, quickly investigate it and bring an enforcement action um, in an effort to expose what's going on. Um, so it's it's out there in the public. You know, it's a it's a public filing when we bring a complaint, and, and hopefully uh, other people will see, oh, you know, this is actually not a legitimate investment. This is something that um, is, in fact, a fraud. Um, and hopefully will prevent other people uh, from falling for that same uh, fraud. Um, and we also try to help the folks who have already fallen victim to it. Uh, the other thing we do uh, as part of our authority as regulators for, you know, broker dealers and, and investment advisors is try to ensure uh, that those registered companies are doing everything that they need to be doing under existing law, um, making sure that you know they are uh, protecting customer data um, and, and that they are taking the steps um, that they need to to protect their own customers. Um, and that's a very effective way of preventing these things. Uh, when the secretary spoke earlier, he talked about you know trying to push legislation requiring financial institutions to kind of you know, hold off. Um, 
giving money out when it, something seems suspicious. Uh, we very rarely get calls from people saying, hey, I went into a, a financial institution and had trouble getting my money out. Um, those calls are a lot more easy to handle than the call when the money's already gone. Um, so to the extent that we can ensure uh, that these registered entities, these registered broker dealers and investment advisors are complying with existing law, that they are putting their customers' interests first and they're putting their customer security first, um, that is a high priority for us and we find that to be a highly effective way of helping people avoid falling into these scams. Great, thank you. And, and following up on that question, are you, um, are you seeing situations where federal, state law enforcement is able to return funds to consumers who have been victimized by these scams? Uh, sure, um, I'll go first with that. I mean, I think that I'll start by saying that when we are successful, it's great for consumers, it's great for the agency, and you know, it's great to stop scammers and get some money back. Unfortunately, it is the rarer case that we're able to get uh, significant sums back. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. One is that we can't bring every case. Uh, two, our monetary authority, at least in the current Supreme Court landscape, has been scaled back a little bit. But we have been successful. Uh, and when we have uh, like business coaching scams is one area where we've been quite good at getting money back uh, for consumers. Um, we just finished litigating a few um, out west where we're able to get maybe not full refunds for consumers, but maybe you know, at least refunds of you know, the initial investments they have put into the program. Uh, so we, we have been successful in many cases involving uh, scams where there, is, there are sums that have not been dissipated by the fraudsters. So a lot of times you may find a situation where the fraudsters have already spent the money. They've you know, put it somewhere overseas, they've you know, started laundering it, like whatever. There may not be a lot left to recover. But where there are sums to recover, we are very sophisticated and very good at trying to do that. So um, we, I wish I could say it was the majority of the cases, but sadly it is not. Uh, but we have been able to return money for consumers uh, in certain instances. I think we, we experience the same uh, situation where once the money's gone, it, it's usually gone. Uh, one avenue of relief that we've uh, used in the, in the securities division is holding firms that were required to be supervising their agents um, responsible and, and seeking redress through those firms. That's been one avenue where we have had um, some success. It's, it's a limited situation where we can do that but if it's the, the right type of case, that's certainly something that we're going to do. Um, and we're always putting you know, consumer recovery and restitution uh, as our top priority when we bring our enforcement actions. So you know, if it's a situation that involves a registered entity, oftentimes that's a, a great place to try to seek recovery. Thank you. Um, Under Secretary D'Amelio, turning to you, I know that your office has been focused on the role of payment apps in uh, fraud. Can you talk a little bit about how that relates to consumer redress? Sure, so our state, we're one of only two states that do not regulate PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, Cash Apps. Our banking law is over 100 years old in our state. Um, we are working really hard with the legislature and the Financial Services Committee. Um, Chairman Murphy has been our lead stalwart in the House and we came close last session, but we are, the Banking Commissioner Mary Gallagher and I are, it is our number one priority to get cash apps regulated in our state for domestic money transmission. If my daughter uses it, so many people use cash apps today. People pay their rent with cash app. It's directly tied to your bank account. And so, you know, if you have money sitting in a Venmo account and you don't move it um, and you get compromised, that money is gone. There's nothing that the division of banks as the regula regulatory entity can do. Um, we, we work with the AG's office all the time, again, because we don't have a, you know, the law that allows the division of banks to, and we call it network supervision, where they would work across the country with other division of banks with these entities. And I will say they are, they are supporting this model law effort because it also is good for the good actors to be regulated in the marketplace for consumers. 
Um, so we are, the, the bill number is House Bill 1106. It was reported, we actually testified the same time the Secretary testified the same day on um, the other bill that the, the Secretary spoke about. It's been reported out favorably and we're working really hard. The end of the session is this year, July 31st, um, to, get it, to get it passed and so that we can actually have some oversight um, with these cash apps because again, this is what we all use and it's part of our daily lives at this point in time. So just be very careful is what I'm saying right now. Um, they get calls a lot, but there's nothing they can really do to get that money back once you've been hacked. Um, and then I'd be remiss not to mention earlier, one of the things that if you have had fraud occur, you can call and get your, run your credit check and get a free credit report and put a fraud alert on your account. Um, I know sometimes people complain that it then gets a little difficult as you're trying to recover from that fraud because you'll go to a, uh, a store and they'll decline you because you have a fraud alert, but it is just another way that you can protect yourself once you have been defrauded to try to recover um, so that it, uh, it kind of shuts down the, the scammers who are trying to continue to steal some of your money or open a credit card in your name um, or purchase something large. A lot of times they'll do like a $2 transaction to see if it went through. And so if you're not watching your bank statement, um, you, you may miss it and say, I don't know where that $2 came from. And my, this happened to my daughter with an Uber hack to her account. And she said, Mom, I'm, it's the summertime. I'm not using Uber. I'm like not at school. And it was, it was somebody testing her account, we went to the bank, shut it down, and she, they actually, it took about six weeks, but they did reimburse her for the money that that fraud occurred. So that, that would be one thing I, did, I wanted to make sure I mentioned. Yeah, thank you for, for raising that point about credit freezes. That's a very useful tool. Um, we'll have time to take questions at the end of the session, um, um, but next I wanna turn to Commissioner Shea. I'd like to ask you, you know, we've, we've been talking about um, the, the complexity of this problem, and we've discussed some of the activity that's happening on the enforcement side, but what else needs to be done on a systemic level? How can we fight this problem? Sure, so I think from the uh, kind of aging network perspective, uh, from the councils on aging, the area agencies on aging, the ASAPs out there, one of the things that we all do um, that's really important is raising awareness among the older adults that we work with. Uh, so I know we have a bunch of folks that we actually brought here today. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, but we are, we are also translating today into Cape Verdean Creole. Um, uh, and I think making sure that people have accessible information in the language that they speak and in a format they can understand is really important and, uh, and folks in the aging network are usually pretty good at understanding their communities and how to connect with and engage with their communities. Um, for us, we also, uh, we have something called Seniority Magazine and most councils on aging have newsletters. Um, and our magazine, we print 15,000 copies of, and we have an online following as well. And we uh, try to, in uh, the nine issues that are written issues every year, um, we try to put, uh, have like a scam corner and put information about a, a different scam uh, in each issue so that we can keep that fresh in, in folks' minds. Um, we also, our, our 10th issue is a calendar issue and so we put information on scams in there as well that people can have kind of hanging on their, on their wall. Um, in addition, uh, we have folks coming in, uh, like, like the folks on this, this panel and, and all the people in their offices, um, coming in to do presentations um, out at our senior centers. Um, we also do a lot of training of our staff so that they can know what to do if someone comes to them um, with a situation and they can know how to address it. Um, and we help the older adults that come to us kind of navigate the systems that we've been talking about to make sure that the correct accounts get notified and um, that we're doing um, uh, some reporting of those scams as well. Um, and finally, another thing that we do and that others do as well is um, we take some of the programs that we run and we also try to train people um, 
uh, to use those to train people. So for example, we have an age and, age and dementia friendly business training that my office does working with local businesses. And in, in particular within that we have an age and dementia friendly bank training that we've built out. So we're training local banks. Um, local banks do a lot of work around scams and fraud and kind of recognizing that. Um, but in our training, we're sharing resources uh, from the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. There's an age, uh, an age friendly banking toolkit that we are trying to get out there and, and let folks know about. Um, we also have an AmeriCorps Seniors RSVP program, and we have a cohort of volunteers that are trained in the um, Money Smarts for Older Adults program. Um, so they are actually going out and giving trainings to other older adults in the community around Money Smarts, where um, part of it is how you recognize and address um, scams and fraud. So those are some of the things that we do and others can do out there. That's, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you, Commissioner Shea. And if I could follow up with you um, and ask uh, if there are people in the audience who are working with older adults and are thinking about trying to implement um, some of what you've described um, in their own programs um, and maybe you're just getting started, where should they start? Yeah, uh, so, so I think in terms of where to start, there's, uh, well, there's a lot of information out there around scams and fraud, um, uh, kind of all of the different things that we talked about today. Also, depending on kind of what uh, trade association they might be connected with. I'm the board chair for Mass Councils on Aging, and we, um, we do do a lot of trainings for council on aging providers um, and, and others, um, whether it's uh, trainings throughout the year or trainings at our annual conference where folks can come and just get some information and learn. But I would say there's no, there's no wrong direction. It's just about reaching out to somebody, forming a connection, and trying to see how we can make sure that we get folks connected to information. That's great. Um, and Matt, can I ask you, what about the Secretary of State's office? Are there ways that the Secretary of State's office can be helpful to professionals who are trying to start anti-fraud programming? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, reach out to us. and. and let us know what you're trying to do, and to the extent we can be helpful, we're, that's why we're there. Um, my colleague Peter Cassidy uh, had a really good idea the other day. He mentioned um, one thing we can do is help you vet speakers. Um, you don't want to be bringing the fox into the hen house. Um, so, you know, if, if you want to say, hey, we're, we're thinking about having you know a lunch program, whatever, and so and so is going to you know speak, we, we can be helpful in that regard as well, and um, we're happy to do that. Um, but anytime you want to reach out with any questions, uh, please feel free to do so. I would also offer, Robin Putnam is here with my office and she does a lot of the community outreach events in our, across the Commonwealth, so please call our office and she would gladly help you put together a anti-fraud panel uh, and she, she has tremendous amount of information and depth in um, all of this. And I'll echo all of what my fellow panelists have said, I mean we are really out there in terms of our consumer outreach mission. It's, about half of what we do. Half of what we do is casework, and half the battle is fought really educating consumers and empowering them. So we work with a lot of um, elder law organizations and uh, you know, community centers to really educate folks about what is going on. We have a lot of great literature that's easy to read, and we also frequently go out on the speaking tour to actually bring you know, what we've learned from enforcement and kind of seeing what's going on uh, to consumers directly. So if you're interested in any of that, please uh, reach out to us and you know, certainly we have folks who are willing to work with your organizations to actually make sure that you either get a speaker that you need or a presentation that you want or any kind of information that you need to educate your consumers. Great. Um, well, I want to thank our panelists. This has, has been wonderful having this conversation with you this morning. Um, we do have just a few minutes, and so I wanted to see if there were any questions either in the audience or online. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'm wondering what I should do when I invariably, at least once a week, get something in my email that I don't open, um, I just um, throw it in the garbage, but should I be reporting that to somebody? Should I be sending that on to a consumer protection agency? 
<laughs> yeah, I would encourage you to report it if you can. I mean, the more we learn about this stuff, the more we get better at stopping it. Uh, and I cannot tell you how many times, how many hours a day we all spend looking at consumer reports just to see what's going on out there so we can see how to better identify the latest scam emails, the latest scam phone calls. So if you got something that you think is a scam, and I would certainly err on the side of reporting it. Um, with, with data breaches, with the alerts, I have become kind of, um, I don't know, data breach fatigued. You know, it's like I don't even pay attention to it anymore. What am I supposed to do when, when I get this information? Or when, in, you know, the information comes out in the globe, you know, that, that Blue Cross had a data breach. So what am I supposed to do? Wait until somebody comes and takes all my money? You, so on our, they are required as the employer to report to the Office of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation and the Attorney General's Office. And so you can go directly to our website and see if, because they're supposed to send you a letter if you were part of that breach, you're supposed to get a letter, and it'll, that letter will be up on our website so you can verify that it is an act, that the credibility of that letter, and they're supposed to also offer you credit monitoring because of that breach. So there are, I mean, again, there are, there is an, you know, an uptick, I'm not sure. I, you know, the numbers show that it's gone up the last four years, but then it's kind of going back down. So I think that's part of that is, the security that's happening, uh, the better security as the numbers tick back down. Um, but yeah, it is, I, we, we understand the fatigue, um, but the technology today and how quickly they're ahead of us to, for these breaches to occur. And I know, I will say, the employers who ha reach out to us, who report to us, they really want to be good actors here, and they want to do the right thing. They want to follow the law, and they want to protect your information. They are, again, they are, they become also a victim of that hacker, uh, of that data breach. Um, so again, I, I will say this, I know it's fatigue, but please, 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 please do pay attention and come to our website. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, yeah. um, does anyone ever get prosecuted? It sounds like there's no disincentive for the fraudsters at all. Do I have that right? Well, certainly I think that if we can build a case against somebody, we absolutely do. And I think for a lot of us, it's, you know, that's, that's why I got into this work. It is going after the bad guys. And, so to the extent we can identify who the fraudster is and who they scammed, you know, if there's a way for us to actually build a case and stop that person, we absolutely do. And if there's a way somebody else can, we certainly will call out someone else, whether it's the criminal side, law enforcement authorities, or it's our partners in state and local government who can do that, we, we, do, we actively do. Like, I mean, we certainly don't just look at something, someone being scammed and say, you know, we don't want to do anything with this. You know, if we can do something, we absolutely will. And if we know somebody else who has a better position to do it, we absolutely do referrals to them. I will say, as far as local law enforcement goes, at least in my jurisdiction, we have had success in prosecution. Has it helped curb the scams? No. Um, so, for example, if so, uh, Secretary Galvin mentioned that scammers were coming to people's doors and picking up cash. We've had success in prosecuting those people. Um, however, those people are either very minimally involved in the larger scam operation, or they are a rideshare driver that was just hired by someone they don't know to pick up the money and drop it off somewhere. Um, so those people are really the, the lowest of the totem pole, right? So we're, we're not really doing anything to curb the, the, the scams in general. Um, so if the person physically isn't in our jurisdiction, it's very hard for us to, to prosecute, yes. Which is why education is so important, so important. Unfortunately, we're out of time for our panel. I know that there are more questions than we've been able to get to. So um, we do have a short break next. So please, please do feel free to come up and speak with us after the panel. Um, but before we break, I do just want to again thank our panelists. Um, we, we so appreciate your joining us this morning. Thank you as well for the work that you're doing every day to help older people.